Oh, and um, start the webinar. Sorry. Almost forgot to start the webinar, but I opened the Facebook group. Oh, I'm on the wrong page too. I did it. Stop share. Boy, I'm not on my game today. We'll be with you in just a moment. I have to put this here. Let everybody populate. And go like that. Okay, welcome everybody as you're joining. We are about to begin our presentation. We're gonna let everybody kind of populate the room and then we're gonna get going in just a few moments. So welcome to our viewers from Facebook. I do have an announcement for our Facebook viewers. If you're watching on Facebook, you are unable to ask questions in the webinar. If you would like to ask a question in the webinar, it is 6 p.m. Eastern time, September 15th, 2022, and we are live. You can go to the HCMA website at 4hcm.org, click on the menu or the uh, calendar of events, and choose tonight's event and join the Zoom room where you have the ability to ask questions and interact with our panel. So if you are here in the room, I'm going to explain the rules for that in just a moment. And this is our agenda for this evening. So we have a number of participants. Those of you who are in the Zoom room, <coughs> excuse me, um, you will have the opportunity to use the question and answer button in the bottom of the screen for tonight's event. I would encourage you to wait for the talk to be wrapping up before you post your questions because you might find that your question is answered in the talk. Questions that are not answered throughout the evening may be held till the end of the session and be addressed at that time, but we will take small breaks after each presentation to allow a few questions to clarify that person's remarks. At the end of tonight's event, we will stop streaming on Facebook and we will turn off the record feature for the Q&A portion, the end of the Q&A portion of the event for those of you who wish to ask a question and not have it kept in perpetuity on the internet. Um, so it is in the privacy, and I use my air quotes there, of the webinar. So obviously other people will hear it, but it will not be kept on the internet. So if you wanna ask that question, you may also use the anonymous feature so that you don't have to ask a question with your name on it. I'm also going to be um, putting a poll up. I'm gonna launch that. And then as you are um, getting acclimated to the software, you can take the poll. And before Dr. Szymanski speaks, I will go over who is with us here tonight. So I am going to introduce two members of the HCMA staff who are joining us this evening for administrative support. And that is Stacy Titus, our Center of Excellence Coordinator. Say hi, Stacey. Hello, everybody. Good evening. And Julie Russo, our Volunteer Coordinator, who you can say hi, Julie. Hi, everybody. <laughs> and that is the HCMA team here this evening. And now I'm going to introduce, um, my goodness, John, how long have I known you? Probably a good 10 plus years, maybe. Easily. 15. Um, so John Szymanski is the co-director, I believe is your title at this point, of the center. And he's going to kind of lead us off tonight and introduce us to his team. John, take it away. Thanks, Lisa. Um, I wanted to uh, first introduce uh, my team. Uh, my co-director is Dr. Dermot Phelan. Dermot is a good friend, joined us from the Cleveland Clinic two years ago, uh, came in the midst of COVID and has brought a lot of advances to our clinic and to our practice. Uh, our next speaker is gonna be Lucy Rashid. Lucy is an advanced practice provider, a nurse practitioner, uh, and an incredible clinician and uh, runs a lot of our efforts in the HCM clinic. And then finally, you're gonna hear from Dr. Joe Mishkin. Joe is a heart failure specialist, but also has incredible expertise in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And uh, he's gonna talk about management and advance of advanced heart failure in, in HCM. So Lisa, without further ado, should I launch into our uh, first slide presentation? Actually, I'm gonna go first and then I'm gonna hand it back to you to give everybody you got it. a little bit of an update as to what's going on here at the HCMA. Um, so, and to also acknowledge a couple of key items here. All righty. 
So the Big Hearted Warrior Tour is brought to you thanks to the support of our sponsors. And I want to thank Boston Scientific, Invitae, Bristol Myers Squibb, and Cytokinetics for the funding that they provide to make this and other programs available. Without partners, we don't have the bandwidth to do the work that needs to be done. <clears throat> so thank you very much to our sponsors. Excuse the cough. This is still the residuals of May COVID. It's September and I still have the cough. So my apologies as I do that. Um, <clears throat> tonight, we are going to be hearing um, a really interesting agenda. So we're going to look at uh, program overview of what the program looks like at, at um, I always call you guys Sanger, but I know Atrium is the name. Um, and then we're going to talk about advanced imaging and exercise recommendations. We're going to look at novel therapies, advanced heart failure therapies, and then we're going to have some Q&A. So we've got a lot of content to get to tonight. So I'm going to be brief in my comments. I want to bring everybody to um, make sure everybody understands that we have a really great new, it's been about 10 months now, medical education program called HCM Academy. And somebody here might be one of the HCM Academy educators, John. Um, so we thank our HCM Academy educators and our faculty. We're actually meeting Monday to do the next iteration of HCM Academy for next year. And this is a medical education program that's available to your healthcare providers in the comfort of their home and an online experience. It currently is a six module system, five case studies, <clears throat> and the ability to have a session with an HCM specialist who will help guide the, the learners through that process and answer questions. So if you want, I'm sorry, there's the other slide. You can go to thehcmacademy.com or you can go to the HCMA website to learn more. If you would like to understand the funding behind that, a lot of our pharmaceutical partners have funded HCM Academy, including Bristol-Myers, Sanofi, and Cytokinetics. HCM is a hot topic issue out there, ladies and gentlemen. Somehow we went from the back row to the front row and everybody's paying attention to us right now which is a phenomenal thing for the community because there's gonna be more HCM awareness from the clinicians as well as generalized uh, society. So you can just go to the HCMA website right here, look for HCM Academy under our programs and you can sign up and refer your provider or sign up as a provider. And we encourage all our HCMA patients and families and clients to include their doctor, the hometown cardiologist com, uh, contact information there if they have it, so that we can invite their hometown cardiologist to learn more about HCM and work in partnership with their center of excellence of choice. And there we go. So <clears throat> next big thing coming up is our legislative initiative. Um, this is kind of a newer space for the HCMA to be in. Uh, although back in 2015, we passed a law here in the state of New Jersey that required certain elements be included in a well-child examination, as well as improving the sports pre-participation screening uh, process. This is common sense legislation. It is bipartisan. It is to protect children's hearts and hopefully open up the door to allow for family screenings when genetic diseases like HCM and other diseases are identified. So the HCM Act actually stands for the Healthy Cardiac Monitoring Act. So it's not just looking for HCM. And there's going to be some call blocks coming up soon that Julie can help you sign up for. And we are more than happy to have any volunteers that we can for those call blocks to help us educate the legislature on why it is important to look for cardiac disease in the young. <clears throat> it is a major initiative of the HCMA. And I'm happy and proud to say that the American Heart Association has vetted the language of the HCM Act and has given their thumbs up and they're all in support, which is critically important to the success of this legislation. We do hope to have it in every state over the next couple of years, but that doesn't happen without a lot of effort. So please get involved. We've made it really easy. It's called Three Clicks to Save a Life. You can go on right now and sign up, but when we get bill numbers in your state, we're gonna ask you to do it again, because right now we're just doing general awareness, we need to get bill numbers. Those bill numbers need to move through the legislative process. And then we will have legislation that will help protect millions of Americans. So we hope you get involved with that program. <clears throat> Many of our viewers are already aware of the HCMA Recognized Center of Excellence program. It comes with this really cool logo. 
and it is an amazing network. So we are proud to say that as of 2022, oops, not February, that I did all these updates and I went too fast. As of September 2022, we have 46 centers of excellence in this in the system now. In the past couple of months, and this might be news to some people, we have included Columbia Presbyterian Medical Center in New York City and uh, the University of Denver in Denver, Colorado. And those are our two newest programs. We will be formally launching them later uh, this fall, but they're in the system now. You can see the directory listing, but they're big to da, so you get to meet them all. They're gonna be coming up in a couple of weeks. And we have a couple of other programs under review, adding to the access to care for those with HCM. So we're really excited about that. If you wanna learn more about what an HCMA recognized center of excellence is, go to the website, call us up, ask us questions. We'll give you all that information. So I want to talk a little bit about outreach and support to patients. We have an incredibly active Facebook community, as well as other forms of social media, but the most interactive is through our Facebook communities. We have a number of different groups that are linked to our page, talking Facebook language here. Um, our Facebook groups, although they are private, they are large. Uh, our one is approaching, I think, almost 10,000 individuals, which means... There's a lot of people there that will see your data and your questions, and you can also get information from them, but it will not show up on your personal feed that you're, pop, that you're putting questions in there. So you can keep your anonymity and your HCM status private, um, but still participate in a community. We have launched two new programs, well, a couple of new programs internationally as part of our new HCMAI program. And I'm really excited that in two weeks, I will be in Sweden for the first time ever. And as a daughter of a Swedish grandfather, that's kind of a big deal for me. Um, but we've been working with uh, a group of patients from Sweden for a couple of years to try to help them form their own patient advocacy organization with the guidance of the HCMA and our experience. And they have become, or will become very shortly, their own charity. And so we had a little baby, it's called Sweden. And um, they have their own Facebook group. We also work very closely with the Dutch. And they have their own Facebook group and their own community, but we link to them so that we add their, grow their access. Um, we will be working with other countries in the future. If you are from a, a non-US based uh, location and you would like to get involved and become an advocate for your country, please do contact us and we will uh, see about getting you into our process so that we can help you develop out good patient advocacy services for your country. And our discussion groups are meeting regularly. There are multiple programs per week where you can sign up, have conversation with other big hearted folks. Sometimes it's the first opportunity people have had to speak to somebody else with HCM. And we have great moderators. We have some interesting topics and we'll have some specialty groups coming up in the coming year but we wanna thank all of our volunteers for their participation in that program. And as of now, I think we've had well over a thousand participants over the past year into the discussion groups and it just keeps growing every week. Tales from the Heart is our podcast and the artwork there is kind of a little bit of a, what I have going on behind me, my brick wall and my neon sign. Um, once a month, I meet with Marty Marin. Uh, once every other month, I meet with either Dr. Harry Lever or Dr. Steve Nauman, and we have a conversation about a theme of the month. Uh, we have special guests each month as well. And in two weeks, I will be meeting with um, the CEO of Tanaya Therapeutics, Faraz Ali. And for those of you who have not heard the name Tanaya Therapeutics anymore, this is cool stuff, people. Genetic therapies for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy are being developed and Faraz is the lead of one of the companies creating this um, technology. So we're gonna have a discussion about what brought him to this space, what their hopes and dreams are, what the timelines look like, what the cost looks like. We had a meeting today to prepare for it. It's gonna be a really engaging conversation. I encourage you all to listen in. And as always, our Tales from the Heart podcast is live here on Facebook, and then you can pick it up about four days later wherever you get your podcasts. So we hope you join us. And let's see what else we have. Ah, can't forget Invite. Um, Invite and Ambry, but they haven't kind of given us the information internally yet, um, provide free genetic testing to those with HCM in the family. 
So if you are the index patient, the first person identified with HCM, we encourage you to reach out to your physician and ask about genetic testing. And you don't have to worry about the cost because in VTA is what's called a sponsored test. So pharmaceutical industry is actually paying for the testing in hopes of not only identifying HCM, but the other mimickers of HCM like uh, Fabry's disease, amyloidosis, sarcoidosis, and other diseases, Danon's disease that can be identified genetically. So there is no free lunch, you're right. So the cost of that program is the doctor who signs the order will be contacted by a member of the pharmaceutical team from the disease state that might be identified, but they will not have the patient's name. It's a great program. I encourage you all to look into it. You can find information on the HCMA website. Um, and I'm going to leave it there and thank our partners at Atrium Sanger Heart and Vascular to all of our HCMA recognized centers of excellence, to our staff, to our board, to our volunteers, and of course to Brandy and those who don't know who Brandy is. On 2 2 2017 I received a heart transplant and Brandy is my donor's name and without her, I would not be here today. So remember to sign up to be an organ donor and we will get back into our topic here. And I thank you for your attention. Um, John, before I hand it over to you, we've had some really good survey respondents and I can end the poll and give you an idea of what's happening here tonight. Um, let's see. We have 60% of our population from the Southeast, but we've got representation from the West, Midwest, and Northeast. Um, nobody out of the country tonight. 40% are patients, 20% are patients, and they also have a family member. And we have 30% medical advice, uh, I'm sorry, medical providers and somebody from industry, high industry. Um, let's see, 10% of our population were diagnosed in the past two years. 40% are on medication, 20% have ICDs, 30% have had septal reduction therapy, alcohol septal ablation or myectomy, 40% uh, are experiencing atrial fibrillation, 20% have lost a family a member or friend to HCM, 20% um, <clears throat> have had transplants, oh, I'm not the only one here tonight, yeah, um, and 50% have had genetic testing. So we've got a, an interesting group here, kind of diverse. Um, and the new question for Big Hearted Warrior Tour, are you considering a new medication or device at this time? And 20% are evaluating their options at this time and 80% are not. So that gives you a little bit of an understanding of who you're talking to, John. So I'm gonna hand it over to you. Wonderful. Thanks, Lisa. Let me put up my screen. And our faculty can turn off their cameras and put themselves on mute, please. All right. Um, as I listened to Lisa's introduction, one thing that came to mind was that we have somewhat of an identity crisis. What are we? Um, Atrium Health is the name of our healthcare system. And it's one of the largest healthcare systems in the country. We recently uh, united with Wake Forest, uh, Bowman Gray Hospital, and we are soon to have a medical school come to Charlotte, which has been grossly overneeded for many years. Uh, we were initially called the Sanger Clinic, and we are the cardiology providers for Atrium Healthcare, one of the main cardiovascular units. Several years ago, we changed the name to the Sanger Heart Vascular Institute, uh, but our main center uh, is in Charlotte. We now have over 19 offices, regional offices uh, throughout the region, both in North and South Carolina. Um, so Lisa wanted me to talk about who we are and uh, to know who we are, I think it's important to know where we came from. Um, on the left-hand side is Dr. Paul Sanger. And Dr. Sanger uh, was a medical school graduate from Vanderbilt. He's originally from Oklahoma, went to medical school at Vanderbilt, and then did his uh, thoracic surgical training at Duke between 1931 and 1937. Um, after his surgical residency, he enlisted in the army and following World War II, came back to Charlotte and started a solo thoracic surgical practice. In 1956, 
an immigrant from Hungary by the name of Francis Robicek uh, left his native land. And Francis at the age of 27 was one of the first uh, cardiac surgeons in the world actually, and, and in Europe. He was the chair of a surgical program in Hungary and very similar to what's happening today, there was some aggression from the Russians that forced him out of the country. He had a cousin who lived in Charlotte and his cousin introduced him to Paul Sanger and the two struck up a friendship and Francis did some additional training under Dr. Sanger and they became partners. Um, unfortunately, their partnership lasted a short period as Dr. Sanger uh, developed cancer and he actually succumbed to carcinoid uh, syndrome and died at the age of 62. But shortly before his death, Dr. Robicek honored him by calling their practice the Sanger Clinic. And so from those humble beginnings, we've, we've grown quite a bit. Um, Dr. Robicek hired the first cardiologist in around 1970, um, Dr. Butch Harbold. And in the last 50 years since Dr. Harbel joining as the first cardiologist, our practice has exploded. And we now have offerings in a multitude of areas, including hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, advanced heart failure and transplantation. Dermot has brought sports cardiology to the clinic. We have an aortic center of excellence, vascular medicine, and we now have over 19 centers through Southwestern North Carolina and the Northern part of South Carolina. We have over 111 physicians, including 88 cardiologists, 23 surgeons, and 125 advanced practice providers. So Charlotte has sort of served as the hub of the spoke or the spoke of a hub of the wheel. And we have many regional places, but our hypertrophic cardiomyopathy program has been centered in Charlotte. So we do get a lot of regional referrals, both from our own practice and also from primary care providers throughout the region. Um, one thing we're very proud of this next coming year, one of our partners, Dr. Hadley Wilson, has been selected to be the next president of the American College of Cardiology, which is a tremendous honor. And we were very proud of Hadley and the contributions. We look forward to his, his presidency. The other thing we're very proud of is that in April of 2021, we opened this brand new outpatient facility, which houses our hypertrophic cardiomyopathy center, as well as advanced imaging and all of our cardiology practices. It's a state-of-the-art facility. It's open, it's airy, it's convenient to get to. And, and we're extremely proud of what this brings to our patients and the, and the individuals we take care of. This is the front of the building and to the left is Medical Center Plaza 2, the Heart and Vascular Institute is housed in Plaza Building One. Inside that building, we've got on the second floor, the left upper image is of our advanced imaging center. You can see the patient care examination rooms are nice and spacious and open and airy. On the bottom left is actually something we haven't been able to take advantage of to date just because of COVID but this is actually an educational facility for patients and it's a kitchen. So we can do teaching about diet, about exercise, whatever needs to be done, but patient education is becoming an important aspect of what we provide. And the image on the bottom right is our cardiac rehabilitation facility, which is housed inside the building, a state-of-the-art exercise facility. So we can provide exercise prescription to individuals who are undergoing surgery or just rehabilitating from heart attacks or various types of procedures. So this is really a, a unique facility and something we're extremely proud of. A lot of patients and individuals ask, what is a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy center of excellence? And, and this is something that Lisa has spent enormous energy on, and it really is unique. Um, at the hub of a hypertrophic center of excellence, has to be dedicated providers who have knowledge, expertise, and in fact, a passion for taking care of, of this very complex disease. Um, other important elements include cardiac imaging, and you're gonna hear more about this through Dr. Phelan tonight, echocardiography, cardiac MRI, cardiac CT, 
and cardiopulmonary exercise testing or CPEP are the initial elements of cardiac imaging. Cardiac rhythm management is an important aspect of HCM care and our electrophysiology colleagues work with us closely. So initially we'll try medical therapies, but they have to also be available for provision of ICD therapy for those who are at high risk for sudden death. Ablation for both atrial and ventricular arrhythmias. Cardiac CT surgery and structural heart interventions are also an important aspect of HCM care. We have an experienced surgeon who provides all of our myectomy services. Alcohol septal ablation is provided through our structural heart team and mitral clip also through our structural heart colleagues. You're gonna hear through Joe Mishkin about advanced heart failure options. And these include such things as left ventricular assist devices, cardiac transplantation. And for those who are not thriving, options for palliative care management. Genetic counseling and testing is imperative. And as Lisa pointed out today, we have availability of testing through Invite for free. We have a geneticist who comes to our clinics regularly, but we also have to have access for, petito, for fetal and maternal medicine, for reproductive counseling. And then another pillar is our clinical research and outcomes. And I'll talk about our opportunities in clinical research and how this is important. And finally, patient support, education and advocacy. And really there's no organization that has done this better for any medical condition than the Hypertrophic Cardiomyopathy Association. And this is kudos to Lisa and her team. Uh, but in addition to the services she provides, locally we need the availability of social services, a pharmacist to help with patients obtaining medications, exercise prescription, which you'll hear more through Dr. Phelan tonight, and then dietary education and sleep medicine. So in essence, it really takes an army of individuals to take care of individuals with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. This is the um, lineup of our team. And really this is just the tip of the iceberg of individuals who are involved in HCM care at our center. Um, myself and Dr. Phelan are co-directors. Joe helps with our advanced heart failure, transplantation, and left ventricular assist devices. Sumi Joseph is a molecular geneticist who assists us with genetic counseling, pedigree uh, creation. And then Lucy, who's gonna be talking about Mavic Hampton, is one of our advanced practice providers. Larry Watts is our surgeon who provides all of our myectomy services. And then Gonzalo Wallace and Adam Morrison attend to our pediatric population. Um, our practice for our HCM center started in 2015, and we started off rather, uh, rather slowly, uh, but you can see that each and every year we've increased our volume of patient visits, both new and returns. You see there's a bit of a dip in 2020 when COVID hit us and we had to pivot from live visits to a virtual platform but things are picking up in the last two years significantly. Um, our approach and who we are at, at Sanger Heart and Vascular Institute is that we try to provide a uniform evaluation for every new patient. And this basically starts with an EKG, a clinical history. We'll do a dedicated family history and pedigree analysis. And then from here, we'll launch into advanced imaging. Every patient, will undergo echocardiographic evaluation to look at the pattern of hypertrophy, the presence or absence of outflow tract obstruction, quantifying outflow gradients. And then cardiac MRI is also imperative in the management of individuals. We both look at regional patterns of hypertrophy. We look at scar distribution and burden. And from that, we can determine if patients may be at high risk for a sudden death. Cardiac CT, uh, can be used to image the coronary arteries. So if there's issues about patients having chest pain or in our preoperative assessment before undergoing myectomy, some individuals may undergo cardiac CT. But we can get some dramatic images and Dermot's gonna share some, some insights about that tonight. Um, arrhythmia management is also an important thing. Not only ventricular arrhythmias and sudden death risk, but also atrial arrhythmias have a significant burden in the HCM population. So 
ambulatory ECG or Holter monitoring is done routinely and systematically in, in all patients. And from there, we'll determine whether we feel they're at risk for sudden death and need a defibrillator. And then finally, opportunities for septal reduction surgeries in the obstructive HCM individuals who don't do well with medical therapies. There is the opportunity to pursue septal myectomy, alcohol septal ablation, and in selected individuals, mitral clip to placate the anterior and posterior light mitral leaflets and eliminate mitral regurgitation. So we try to use this comprehensive format in all patients, but I think more importantly, we feel it's imperative that the patient have the best understanding about their, their condition so that they can be participants in decision-making in a shared format. Now, clinical trials are another important opportunity for the patients, and we feel it's important for us to be on the cutting edge of what's being developed in HCM care. Um, some, uh, an option that I think is really important for patients is that through this NIH website called clinicaltrials.gov, you can actually go in there, enter your condition, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and by clicking on some of these additional uh, uh, items, you can get a listing or a printout of all the available clinical trials that are ongoing and currently enrolling patients, both locally and throughout the, th throughout the world. Um, so I, I do encourage my patients to look at this, but we've been participants in a number of studies. And I think it's important to understand how clinical trials progress. Um, whenever a new device or drug is being um, considered for management, the earliest phase of a clinical trial is called a phase one study. And this is where the basic benchmark testing is done, usually in laboratory animals but also single dose phases in human, in human subjects where we're trying to determine the safety, trying to determine a safe dosage, and importantly, learn if there are any downstream effects that may be undesirable. From phase one, the next opportunity is for phase two, and about 70% of drugs and devices that enter phase one will then progress into phase two, where we're looking more closely at dosing trying to identify an optimal dosing regimen for the patient, and importantly, look further into safety and efficacy of the drugs. From phase two, about another 33% will go on to phase three. And these are more rigorous studies where we're looking at a more finite number of dosing regimens, and we may be comparing the medication with other standardized treatments that are available, but wanting to collect additional information. Once the study, a phase three study is completed, then usually there is an application to the FDA for clinical approval. And as you know, Mavacampton for obstructive HCM recently completed phase three studies and approval through the FDA. So Mavacampton has now moved into phase four. And in phase four, we're doing extended follow-up long-term looking for side effects uh, on unintended consequences that may not have been recognized. So I think it's important for the, for the patients who may be engaging in a clinical trial to understand these various phases. We were proud participants in two of the landmark studies for Mavacampton. The first one, Maverick HCM, was a phase two study looking at the use of Mavacampton in non-obstructive HCM patients. And then the Explorer was a phase three study looking at Mavicampton and obstructive HCM patients. And as I said, the Explorer data gave us credence and, and allowed FDA to provide approval. So now we have Mavicampton available uh, commercially and the, the trade name is CAMSIOS and Lucy's gonna talk about this more. Um, the current trials that we're participating in at Sanger Heart and Vascular Institute um, include some uh, studies for obstructive HCM. Right now, we're enrolling patients in what's called the Sequoia trial, which is a phase three study of cytokinetics agent Afficampton, an agent that's similar to Mavicampton, but may have some potential added benefits. Um, in the non-obstructive venue, 
Um, we have been enrolled, enrolling patients in Improve HCM, which is a analog of trimetazidine. Um, and then we have through cytokinetics, uh, the Redwood HCM cohort four investigation and through Bristol-Myers Squibb, the agent Mavicampton and the Odyssey HCM. And then finally, individuals who are participating or have completed those trials have eligibility to be followed in long-term extension studies. The real benefit of some of these long-term extension studies is that the patients get access to medication at a reduced or nominal cost. And they can also be followed clinically having serial testing to be sure that everything is going well. So a lot of opportunities for, for research. Again, this is not our main focus, but it is an adjunctive um, uh, opportunity for patients who may be uh, active or wanting to be enrolled in some of these trials. Uh, I'm gonna, next gonna move over to some of our clinical um, uh, studies that have actually been brought into publication. And, and Dermot, who you're going to hear from next, was one of the lead authors in this important document from the American Society of Echocardiography on Advanced Imaging Techniques uh, for HCM. So Dermot, that's gonna be a segue to you. I'm going to stop my share and I'm gonna pass this baton over to you to take it from here. I am going to put a pause before we transfer over because I have something that I want to show you all that you might not be aware of that ties right in with Dr. Szymanski's talk. I just want to make my screen a little bit bigger over here. A couple of years ago, the HCMA brought in a, uh, an application into our website called Antidote. And Antidote helps you identify clinical trial opportunities based on a disease state. And here we have the HCMA research journey page, which you can find right here. And there's this little box that says, search for an active HCM trial. It's already pre-populated with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and it includes obstructed and non-obstructed. So all you need to do is jump on in, answer some questions, and it will tell you oh, seven, eight, six, six. So I'm gonna look for what can we there's 56 trials that I might qualify for, making it nice and easy rather than going through clinicaltrials.gov. I only want to travel 30 miles, so now I'm down to two trials, and we'll just say I'm 50. How about that? <laughs> and I am a female, and I don't want to give my email address because I don't want anybody tracking me. Um, I don't want to give my ethnicity because I just don't feel like it right now. Do I have aortic stenosis? No. Um, do I have obstructive HCM? I'll just say yes for now, even though I don't. Um, do I have aortic valve disease? We've already said that. And here are two trials that I qualify for. One is specific to HCM, and the other is looking at aortic valves, which I don't know why I picked because I said no. But you can get a very quick list. You can get alerts and you can get the keep me posted link. And we've made it really, really easy for you to search for a clinical trial. So if you're not participating in a clinical trial, it's not because we didn't make it easy. Now I will hand it back to you, John. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, Dermot, it's your show. Thanks, John. And thank you, Lisa. Uh, so I'm, uh, uh, my name is Dermot Phelan, as, as uh, Dr. Szymanski uh, mentioned, and, and I want to first of all thank Lisa uh, for the opportunity to present here tonight to, to everyone and thank everyone for, for their attention. Um, Lisa has done just a, an incredible job with HCMA, as, as John has said, and I think some of the education materials on the website are really uh, remarkable. And for every new patient that comes in to see me, uh, they will attest that the first thing I will do is tell them to uh, sign up to the, the HCMA because of all the resources that are there. Um, so I'm going to talk uh, over the next 15 minutes or so about two uh, things that may be a little bit disparate. Uh, first of all, I'm going to talk about advanced imaging, and then we're going to talk a little for a few minutes about exercise recommendations in HCM. And the unifying theme here is that these are my two passions. Uh, so I 
wear a number of hats here on Sanger Heart and Vascular Institute. I'm medical director of cardiovascular imaging. So I'm very passionate about the role of imaging in the care of patients. Um, I'm also the, co the director of the Sports Cardiology Center. So I deal with athletes with heart disease and oftentimes hypertrophic cardiomyopathy can cross over there. So I'm gonna begin by talking about um, advanced imaging. And so when we uh, talk about any disease, really the first thing we need to be able to do is make sure that we have the, an accurate diagnosis. And once we've made that diagnosis, then we have to develop a plan for how we can best treat that particular patient. And in, in both of these contexts, really advanced cardiovascular imaging is key to our success. So what do I mean about advanced cardiovascular imaging in the context of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? We're really talking about echocardiography, we're talking about CMR, and we're talking about cardiac CT. And these are some of the machines that we have uh, in Kenilworth here uh, at our outpatient facility, just two floors below where I'm sitting right now. So let's begin with echocardiography. So echocardiography is really the workhorse of imaging the heart. This technology uses ultrasound uh, to evaluate the heart and, and it's done by placing a probe on the chest. And at its very basic, we get these beautiful 2D images here where we can see you know, a normal wall thickness and the posterior part of the heart. And then we see this significant increase in wall thickness in the septum here, which is characteristic of a patient with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. We can then use color Doppler and color essentially tracks the direction of blood flow. So we can detect if there's areas where there's leaking of valves or if there's narrowings, which we can see in this particular case. We can use something called Doppler, and Doppler essentially measures the speed of blood, which is really important because we can translate that speed using mathematical equation into a pressure gradient. And so when we're talking about patients with obstruction or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with obstruction, we really need to be able to quantify what that pressure buildup is because that's gonna dictate our management for those individuals. So we'll see these kind of images where we can translate this blood flow into a pressure. Now this can be dynamic. So in what I mean by that is it depends on a certain state. So in some cases, patients can have greater or less obstruction at different times. And so that's why as a patient, you will have the sonographer ask you to bear down. That's something called a valsalva, where we're trying to make that obstruction as bad or as, as severe as possible or we'll do stress echocardiograms. And this really does take a lot of skill and expertise by our sonographers. And so what we do is we've got a, a small number of sonographers that are very, have done a lot of additional training and have a lot of experience in doing this so that they can really define and highlight those uh, gradients there because oftentimes these can be missed. And recently, a new technology has become available called STRAIN, and this looks at the way the heart deforms as it's contracting. And we can use this to pick up some telltale signs of patients who might have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Moving on to, to CMR, this really truly gives us some amazing pictures of the heart muscle. We can see that the signal differences between the blood here, which is usually kind of a white or a very light color and the muscle here. And this really gives us a beautiful definition between uh, what the muscle looks like and what the blood looks like. And we can basically slice and dice the heart here and get these beautiful images from this. And so this slice here gives us the base of the heart and we can see the wall thickness looks pretty normal here. But as you move up towards the center of the heart muscle here, you can see that this wall thickness increases a lot. And then as you get to the tip of the heart or the apex in this particular individual, this area is really not contracting properly at all. And in fact, when we use uh, something, when we, we, we use something called gadolinium enhancement, we can see that there's a lot of scar tissue uh, at the tip of the heart. And in fact, there's a little clot there at the heart. So the MRI really gives us a lot of additional information that's complementary and additional to the echocardiography. Cardiac CT is used less frequently than, than echo, but it can provide these really amazing 3D images of the heart. Um, we can see as we 
look at this beautiful pictures of the blood vessels, the coronary arteries. We can kind of change the settings where we can really skeletonize the coronary arteries. We get these amazing pictures of the anatomy of the coronary arteries. Now, we not only get anatomy, and in some centers, including ours, we can also do something called FFR, which actually gives us an idea about whether there is a problem with flow down these blood vessels. And so here on the right coronary artery, it's nice and blue. We know that there's normal flow, whereas in this vessel, we see a reduction in flow. So we get not only the anatomy, but we get functional information using this uh, CT. Now for patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, we can run special sequences on the CT scan and we can get these kind of amazing uh, views of the heart. And I'm just gonna see if I can pause this here um, and just show here as the heart is squeezing, this mitral valve is coming over and it's obstructing where the blood is trying to exit the heart. And this is where we detect those real big pressure buildups. Now, this particular case is quite difficult because the patient in question did not have a lot of thickening of the heart muscle. And so what we've taken to do is develop these 3D printing models. So we actually do a 3D of the, of the heart and we actually use a printing. So we get these kind of models and we can see the anatomy of the heart exquisitely well, both as the heart is relaxing in diastole and as the heart squeezes here. And the, the surgeon, uh, can get this in their hands and, and Dr. Watts uses these and can use this to decide how much muscle he needs to remove during the surgery and whether we need to do something with the mitral valve. And in this particular case, we realized that a lot of the work needed to be done with the mitral valve. So this is before the surgery and after the surgery, we really reduced the height of the mitral valve and did a small myectomy. And this patient had a really uh, phenomenal outcome there. So with advanced imaging, the first thing we want to do is make the diagnosis, as we said, and we can be the victims on both sides of this. We can overcall uh, imaging and end up telling patients that they have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy when they actually don't. And that has a lot of implications for that patient and their family members in terms of screening and so on. In fact, the more common error is where we underestimate the number of patients who have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. It's, it's estimated about 90% uh, of people with HCM are actually unaware of the diagnosis. And it's, it's quite frequent, unfortunately, that we see people who previously had imaging done of their heart, but they didn't, it wasn't detected that they actually had hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So you really need to have that high level of suspicion there. The second thing we do with advanced imaging is we prognosticate. So there are a lot of features on the imaging that can tell us a story about the patient. They can tell us if they're high risk of dangerous rhythms, for example, if patients have sig very severe thickening of the wall, if they've got scar tissue, a lot of scar tissue, if they've got aneurysms or outpouching, or if the function of the heart goes down. And some of these can be very subtle. And so really you have to pay a high degree of attention because in those individuals, we recognize that those are very high risk features, which leads us to management. And we, you know these features, once we identify will tell us that these are patients that we need to think about defibrillator therapy. And so really it's important to recognize that our management over the course of the last two decades has dramatically changed. And the prognosis of patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy has changed because we've improved our ability to risk stratify, to be able to tell which patients are high risk, which patients are low risk. And for those patients who are really high risk, use defibrillator therapy. And that's really dramatically changed the outlook for patients. The other major finding that we're looking for is obstruction to blood flow. And this will occur in about a third of patients when they're resting. But about a third of patients, this will only happen when we provoke it. And that's where having sonographers really know what they're dealing with and really know how to provoke these gradients uh, is so important so that we can identify those, those um, patients that have obstruction only in certain situations. Our imaging will then allow us to select which patients would be most suitable for specific therapies to address that obstruction to blood flow. So we use that advanced imaging then to guide us during the septomyectomy here, the alcohol septal ablation, uh, or the, the, in some cases where we can do mitra clips, and this is kind of an off-label use, and this would really be reserved for centers who see a lot of patients, but the imaging really is 
fundamental to us to selecting which patient should go for which therapy and then actually guiding the procedures themselves. Uh, John and uh, Lisa already mentioned Mavicantin or Camzios, and so this is the new generation of medication specifically designed to treat patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and we're really hoping that this will be a great game changer for our patients. However, it's important that we recognize that both the initiation of the medication and the dosing requires close follow-up with imaging. So week four, week eight, week 12, and every 12 weeks after that, we have to do imaging. And that imaging is then deciding whether the patient should stay on the medication and what dose the medication of the medication the patient should stay on. So once again, this highlights how much we rely on excellent imaging for the management of patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So it really requires a, a lot of expertise and dedicated additional training above and beyond what we would consider standard practice to be able to properly image patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So we make the correct diagnosis and then we can define an individual uh, strategy or treatment plan. So as I mentioned, we've got a small dedicated cohort of sonographers, of MR techs, of CT techs with dedicated imaging protocols, really focused to make sure that this is done to the highest level. As you can see, this is the building John showed you earlier. On the second floor here uh, is where we have all of that imaging, all the echoes, CTs, MRIs are here. And on the fourth floor here is where we have our uh, clinic. So we try to make sure that we do all of this testing at once and, and make it as easy as possible for the patients. So now I'm gonna change tack here and, and talk about exercise in patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And so we'll touch on this just for the last few minutes. And because this is, is really a particular uh, area of interest of mine. And there has been and, and really remains a concern that exercise itself may be a trigger that causes sudden cardiac arrest. And as a result, for, for many, many years, doctors have, have taken this very paternalistic approach to, to patients uh, and indeed athletes who have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy as they've been worried that exercise might precipitate a bad or dangerous rhythm of the heart. And so even the most recent guidelines, the 2015 guidelines that uh, discuss exercise in athletes who have heart disease, recommend those who have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy stick to very low intensity exercise. So things like bowling, cricket, curling, golf, riflery, and yoga. And to be honest, many doctors over many years have taken an a extremely conservative approach and basically told their patients with HCM to not make not take any exercise at all. Unfortunately, I believe that this has really been very poor advice and, and we really see many downstream ill effects of this advice. And this is one particular study which looks at physical activity and other health behaviors in people with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy compared to the general population. And we see that adults with HCM report less time in physical activity of higher body mass index and these restrictions have negatively emotionally affected patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. More recently, we've recognized that exercise actually has a lot of benefit in patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Low intensity exercise is where the guidelines have recommended, but we've rec recognized traditionally the older guidelines, I should say, we've recognized now that moderate intensity in a number of studies and trials have shown a lot of benefit for patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And so the updated guidelines, the 2020 guidelines have now made a strong recommendation that patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy should engage in regular moderate intensity exercise. And um, there are some in patients who are more interested in engaging in high intensity and even competing as athletes. And there may be some benefits to do that, but there may also be some additional risk with that. And these for those individuals who are interested in participating in high intensity exercise, I think that really needs to be guided by specialists who have experience in both hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and dealing with athletes. So for many people, they want very specific guidance on what moderate exercise means for them, or if they are going to do high intensity exercise, what kind of intensity exercise they should do. And this is really where stress testing plays such an important role. And, and more specifically, metabolic stress testing. And so 
Here we have two uh, wide bore metabolic uh, labs. Also, we've got a cycle ergometer here. And so we do fairly sophisticated cardiopulmonary testing, which gives us uh, the opportunity to give very clear guidance on exercise for our patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And I, I really do believe that this is vitally important for patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And any patient that I've seen will tell you that I spend at least a part of our consultation talking about exercise um, because this is key to their care. And so Lisa, uh, that is all I have. And I'm happy to hand back over to you. Um, and I think either Lucy or Joe is up next. Well, I'm going to hand it to John, who's going to introduce his next staff member, or team member, I should say. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, Lucy Rashid is up next, and, and Lucy is going to talk to us about implementing Mavicampton. Lucy is one of our advanced practice providers. She's been with our HCM center for the last four years and does just an outstanding job. She has more knowledge and expertise than many cardiologists uh, regarding HCM, and uh, it's a delight to introduce her. Lucy, it's up to you. So, oh, there she is. There you go. Hi, Lucy. Um, just a quick note to the attendee who's raising their hand. We're not using the hand raising feature in the webinar. If you have a question, please go to the bottom of your Zoom browser and you will see a Q&A box and you can open your Q&A box and ask a question there. Thank you very much. And Lucy, it's all up to you now. All right. Okay. All right. So I'm going to be talking about um, novel therapies, particularly uh, the new myosin modulator Mavicampton. So um, Camzios or Mavicampton, it was first FDA approved myosin modulator therapy uh, shown to improve the functional capacity and symptoms in patients with symptomatic NYHA class two and three obstructive hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. The design of the drug is to counteract the hypercontractility by reducing excessive myosin actin cross bridging. The EXPLORE HCM trial, which we were um, actively participated in, showed Mavicampton was superior to placebo at improving exercise capacity and reducing post-exercise LVOT obstruction. So it causes a dose-dependent reduction in the ejection fraction, and EXPLORE HCM was designed to kind of help identify the lowest effective dose at reducing the outflow track obstruction while maintaining the ejection fraction. It does have a black box warning for heart failure and reduction in injection fraction, and that's where a lot of the uh, monitoring comes into place with the initiation of the drug. So it requires very frequent echocardiogram assessment of the ejection fraction prior to and throughout the treatment of CAMS-IOS. And then titration and dosing is based on the outflow track obstruction and the ejection fraction. Um, so here is kind of a sample of you know, what goes into initiation of cams -IO. So management and titration is based on the outflow track obstruction and the ejection fraction. So it does require very frequent echocardiogram monitoring and follow-up. So typically we are initiating the drug at five milligrams and it can only be initiated if the ejection fraction is greater than 55%. It requires an echocardiogram at week four with follow-up week eight and week 12. And then, you know, based on the outflow track obstruction at each of those echocardiograms, you're making the decision to maintain the five milligram dose or down titrate the dose based on a reduction in the LVOT. And at any time, if you see the ejection fraction less than 50%, you have to discontinue the drug. So then you're going to be in a maintenance phase once you get through those um, initial four-week echoes. Um, and at every 12 weeks, you continue to require echocardiogram monitoring to assess the ejection fraction. Uh, based on these echocardiograms at every 12 weeks, you'll continue to monitor the LVOT as well and can further up titrate the dose at week 12 based on an LVOT of greater than 30 millimeters of mercury as long as the ejection fraction remains above 55%. Um, and then you maintain the dose at 12 weeks if the uh, LVOT is less than 30, and then interrupt treatment again at any time if the ejection fraction is less than 
Uh, and kind of again reiterating that the big takeaway with this drug is, you know, interrupting treatment at any time if the ejection fraction is less than 50%. So um, if you do identify that at one of the echoes, then you're stopping treatment and you repeat the echo every four weeks until you see the ejection fraction above 50%. And then at that time, you can restart treatment at the next lowest dose. So if you were um, at five, then you're going to go to 2.5. However, if you were at a 2.5 milligram dose, then you permanently discontinue treatment if the ejection fraction falls below 50%. So the biggest thing in our clinic as we've started to initiate this therapy is identifying the right patient. So it requires a patient with um, symptomatic class two or three obstructive hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. The ejection fraction needs to be above 55% with an outflow track obstruction greater than 30 millimeters of mercury, um, confirming absence of pregnancy and use of effective contraception. Um, and then on a current stable um, medical regimen for their HCM, which can include beta blockers and calcium channel blockers, if they're on both of them, then we're typically taking away one of those, and it cannot be, they can't be on concomitant use of disopyramide or Renexa. Um, so a lot goes into, you know, evaluating the right patient and um, going into looking at all the medications they're currently on, making sure they're, you know, already at a stable regimen for their HCM before we initiate uh, this medication. So it really has been taking a team approach we have found in our clinic to get this drug started. Um, you know, the first step in the initiation is, you know, the provider identifying the patient. It is a REMS drug, so the provider must be enrolled in the CAMS-IO's REM program in order to even be able to prescribe the medication. So that provider must then identify the appropriate patient um, that they would like to start the drug on. In our clinic, then the ball kind of goes to our pharmacist who is educating the patient on the medication and reviewing any side effects that can come with the medication, as well as doing a very thorough review of the patient's home medication list. This drug comes with a lot of drug-to-drug -drug interactions, and you know, that plays a major role in identifying the right patient, um, you know, making sure we're stopping any medications that we're able to stop that would be a possible drug-to-drug -drug interaction. Um, so there's a lot that goes into kind of reviewing the patient's home medication list, reviewing supplements that they may be on, you know, talking to providers that may have started a drug that we may need to discontinue before we can get this medication started. Um, and then the pharmacist en enrolling the patients um, in the CAMS-IOS program, and then they're following up with that patient after initiation and then with each dose titration. Another major player in getting this medication started is our social worker. Um, they're at the time of initiation, going in and speaking to the patient, you know, obtaining signatures from the patient for all the necessary paperwork up front. So we can work on making sure we can get this um, drug initiated and most cost effective for the patient. They're enrolling the patient in the MyCAMSIOS um, access program to make sure that they can obtain any support that may be available to them um, through MyCAMSIOS and as well as through the Bristol Myers Squibb Patient Assistance Foundation uh, when that's applicable. And then our nurses at the time of initiation are helping to make sure that the patient leaves that initial visit or leaves the time of um, initiation with follow-up and echocardiogram scheduled ahead of time. So we're just trying to make sure we initiate up front the echocardiograms at week four, eight, and 12, um, and then assisting with any education that's needed. So the major barriers that, you know, we've come is cost is the big one. Um, the frequent follow-up and imaging that's required with initiation of the drug, the significant amount of drug-to-drug -drug interactions, and then just access to the drug. As a lot of our patients are traveling from far distance to come to our center of excellence to be treated for their HCM, so trying to see how we can, you know, make these follow-ups and echocardiograms, you know, most accessible for these patients. Um, so again, ways to alleviate the barriers that we have found working with our social worker. Um, they have been played a huge role in just making sure that they know or they're very knowledgeable about how we can get this drug to these patients, 
the insurance plan the patient has. They're very proactive in making sure we're getting these patients enrolled in any patient assistance program that's available and utilizing those programs, as well as utilizing assistant programs to help alleviate the cost of the serial echocardiograms and follow-ups that are required. Um, our pharmacists have played a huge role in looking through you know, the medications patients are on, um, making sure they review all those medications, reviewing a full home med list, and then with each dose titration and follow up, you know, making sure the patient hasn't been started on any new medications at the time. Um, we know like a lot of these medicines that these patients are on are just kind of standard medicines that can interact. So when it comes to things like birth control, contraception, making sure that we have, you know, all those things in place for the patient, and as well as if we need to discontinue any of their current cardiac medications like a beta blocker, calcium channel blocker, or disapyramide, and then discussing, you know, alternatives with the providers if we do need to discontinue a medication. And, you know, our goal with this clinic or with initiation of this drug is to create what we call kind of a MAVA day. So ensuring that we have availability for these patients that require frequent follow-up. So once we approve um, the patient for the medication and we get things scheduled, our goal is to schedule the follow-up and echocardiograms for those four, um, eight and 12 week assessments. And then every 12 weeks thereafter that fall on this kind of particular day, our hope is certainly to group all of these patients on the same day as we're able to, so we can make sure that we're really keeping up with the titrations so patients don't run out of medications because with each follow-up every four weeks, we have to make sure we get the information into the company so they can dispense the medication quickly to the patient and not um, have any lapse in dosing. And then for access, you know, we're trying to utilize anything we can to help these patients, particularly the ones that are traveling. We're gonna utilize telemedicine if we can to help with some of the frequent follow-ups. Um, we also, you know, our social worker can really help when it comes to transportation issues, making sure we have rides for patients. We're making sure we have the echocardiograms and follow-up scheduled up front. Um, we're also looking into options of patients having, you know, imaging done closer to home, if that's something that can work for them and, you know, talking with those centers to make sure we're getting the appropriate data that we need. Um, so the week that a patient would be due for follow-up or dose titration, making sure we have that um, echocardiogram scheduled before the visit. And then even if it needs to be a different day, the patient can have the echocardiogram done a few days prior and we can do the visit by telemedicine to making sure we're reviewing everything, going over any changes in the home medication list, talking symptoms and next steps as far as dose titration. And that is all. guys come to halt really fast. You're in and then you're boom, done. Um, while we're waiting for your next speaker to come up, I do want to also let everybody know, and we're going to make the formal announcement uh, in a couple of weeks, and it was in our newsletter earlier this week. On January 9th of 2022, we began something called the Lori Fund, which will be providing micro grants for travel to HCM centers. This will not be for uh, clinical trial work. This is strictly for clinical care. So those of you who may have economic need and may need gas money, train tickets, plane tickets, hotel accommodations, food on the road, we will have a, uh, an application available soon on the website where you can fill out the application. Financial information is required to be submitted. And we do need to know where your appointment will be and when it is set up. And these micro grants will be in the area of about $350 per person, but just enough to help curtail some of those expenses and hopefully add to access to care. So I did not prepare a slide on that tonight. You're going to learn a lot more about it soon. And for those of you who remember the name Lori, Lori was my sister who passed away from mismanaged HCM. So in her namesake, we've created this fund. So more availability, more access to care. John, back to you. Go Thanks, ahead. Lisa. We have some questions. Um, yeah, I'm sure there's some questions, especially yeah. about Mava Campton. You know, this is really a, a potential game changer. And I saw one of the questions about how does it actually help? Um, as Dermot mentioned, it reduces the number of myosin actin cross bridges. So the hypercontractility that's in one of the key elements of HCM is curtailed. And so it can help mitigate or alleviate some of the outflow obstruction. 
It can probably also help in the relaxation of the heart. And in addition to seeing reduction in gradients, we've seen lowering of biomarkers of cardiac stress, things like BNP levels. Um, and it works differently than beta blockers and calcium channel blockers or disapyramide. But obviously our biggest concern right out of the box is the sticker shock of the cost. And hopefully with time, uh, we'll see the cost of this coming down with, with Avicamptin coming on board too. We may see some competitiveness and that may help bring prices down. So a lot more to, to come. Um, but as Lucy had pointed out, there are a lot of challenges to getting this off the ground, but we hope it's going to be really uh, a, a game changer for managing our patients. Um, my next speaker is a good friend and an exceptional clinician, Joe Mishkin, trained at the University of Florida and then for a number of years was on faculty at University of Texas Southwestern. Joe's an expert in advanced heart failure management, and so he leads our or takes care of many patients with advanced heart failure who need transplantation and left ventricular assist device, um, including HCM patients. So Joe, I'll take, turn it over to you. Thanks, John. Uh, thanks, Lisa and the HCMA for opportunity to speak with you guys today. We're going to share our screen here and hopefully you guys can see my slides. Uh, great talks, John, Lucy, Dermot. That was, um, you know, really, really good. Um, so we'll move into what do we do when drugs and other conventional therapies for HCM fail and patients have progressive heart failure symptoms. And really, when we talk about advanced heart failure, the first step is defining it. And there's multiple different ways to define advanced heart failure based on objective testing. But I really like to point out the main thing that we look at is how somebody's quality of life is affected. So persistent, progressive symptoms despite medical therapy, patients still having neurocard association class three or four symptoms, and having a quality of life that's just unacceptable. And I think the challenge in HCM particularly is it's often a younger patient population. And younger patients can progress with very advanced heart failure for a much longer period of time and go undetected. So a lot of times we identify advanced heart failure based on how other organs in the body are responding to the heart not functioning appropriately. So liver dysfunction, kidney dysfunction, things like that. In young, young, otherwise healthy patients, those other organs can appear to be functioning completely normally, even when the heart is really limiting somebody's quality of life. On objective testing, like Dermot talked about, cardiopulmonary exercise testing, oftentimes a younger HCM patient may have what looks to be a preserved or normal peak VO2 or oxygen consumption with exercise. But when we look at their age and percent predicted based on age, it's not normal. And certainly we, we see a, a lot of patients um, identified as just having anxiety when actually their lungs are filling up with fluid and that's why they're waking up at night short of breath and, and feeling panic. The other complicating thing about the HCM population is that there's varying phenotypes and clinical course. So what Dermot had mentioned is based on imaging studies, finding evidence of obstruction, and that can cause chest pain and shortness of breath when blood is being obstructed, leaving the heart. And while that's not simple, it's relatively straightforward with advanced imaging, and then that can lead to therapeutic interventions that can relieve symptoms. In HCM patients that are not obstructed, they can still develop very advanced heart failure symptoms, so chest discomfort, shortness of breath, swelling in their extremities, and that can occur for a variety of different reasons. Sometimes it's a progressive stiffening of the thick heart muscle that leads to what we call restriction of the heart. So the heart can squeeze very well, but it cannot relax to fill, and that can cause progressive heart failure symptoms. Sometimes 
over time, the squeeze of the heart will also decline. Um, and so that can be a combination of the heart doesn't relax well. There can be extensive scarring that's seen on MRI, like Dermot had mentioned in his talk. And then sometimes we'll see the thickening of the heart dissipate and the heart will actually become thin. The heart muscle will thin out and the heart chamber will dilate and then not squeeze very well. So a variety of different things that we need to be aware of. For non-obstructive HCM patients whose heart function squeeze reduces, or so the heart enlarges, the heart chamber enlarges, thins out, and the heart can't squeeze well, then we turn to well-studied medications to try and regain some of that squeeze function. And this is what we call guideline-directed medical therapy for heart failure. And we employ a lot of other technologies to try and monitor how somebody is doing, how much fluid they're retaining, and try and intervene on them as best as possible with medications before symptoms progress too much. On the other side, the patients whose heart squeeze remains preserved, but the heart can't relax, we're much more limited in our medical therapy, though there's been some exciting advances over the past three to five years. So we use medications called aldosterone inhibitors to help reduce scar tissue formation in the heart. SGLT2 inhibitors have become another mainstay of therapy for all forms of heart failure. And these medications were originally designed to treat diabetes, but now we're utilizing them in all forms of heart failure. And we're very excited about their positive effect. In some patients, very select patients that we've obtained invasive hemodynamic assessment, we'll consider things like pulmonary vasodilator therapies. These are patients with HCM, preserved ejection fraction, so their heart squeezes okay but does not relax. And that inability to relax increases the pressures inside the heart as well as the pressures inside the arteries in the lungs and that's referred to as pulmonary hypertension. So sometimes we can improve symptoms with medications directed at reducing the pressure of blood flow in the arteries in the lungs. And then again, employing remote heart failure diagnostics. And as Lucy's excellent talk discussed, we're super excited about the myosin modulators in this patient population. And I think they'll expand to even non-HCM patients with stiff hearts that don't relax very well. When we look at the advanced heart failure guidelines for HCM patients, what we're talking about are these patients who, again, have very advanced symptoms despite medical therapy, or they're suffering recurrent life-threatening ventricular arrhythmias. So they have a defibrillator, the defibrillator is working, but those bad arrhythmias continue to happen requiring defibrillator therapies. And those, that's really the patient population that we start looking at um, heart transplantation for. Important to know in the HCM population that once the heart squeeze declines, that's a very poor prognostic indicator. So that's when we start getting very aggressive about assessing somebody's functional capacity, making sure we're following their progress very, very closely on medical therapy because We've learned that there's an increased risk of sudden death events. They have a higher risk of progressing to needing transplantation and a higher over, overall all-cause mortality. And some of the predictors of progression to advanced heart failure in HCM, again, just go back to subjectively, what is the patient's functional status um, or their New York Heart Association class? What is their ejection fraction? And now we're looking more and more with advanced cardiac imaging with MRI, looking at the percentage of scar tissue formation in the heart, or what Dermot referred to as that late gadolinium enhancement. And that can predict a decline in heart function over time. So there are challenges and opportunities for heart transplantation in the HCM population. <clears throat> On the left-hand side of my slide, is the adult heart allocation criteria for heart transplantation in the United States. And so when somebody is placed on the wait list for heart transplantation in the United States, 
the priority on the wait list depends on their status, as well as how long they've been on the wait list. And currently, the highest priority status, status one, status two, are patients who require support with temporary mechanical circulatory support devices. When we look at patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, they are automatically granted status four. So not the highest priority, but at least um, granted a status regardless of what medications they're requiring or what circulatory support devices they're requiring. The challenge in HC, advanced heart failure patients with HCM is that based on the heart oftentimes not being very enlarged or dilated, so the chamber of the left ventricle not being dilated, as well as the underlying disease process, the stiffening of the heart muscle, a lot of the devices and medical therapies that we use for the failing heart are not helpful in that patient population. So often the medicines and the devices that escalate somebody's prioritization or status on the list don't help. So we have to look at various ways to help escalate the status of our HCM population on the list as they get sicker and sicker while they're waiting. Sometimes that includes writing a letter of exception to our regional United Network of Organ Sharing Board explaining the physiology and the hemodynamics and why a patient requires a higher status. And then recently here at Atrium Health Sanger Heart and Vascular Institute, we have obtained technology that allows us to go farther and preserve donor hearts longer with an organ care system. So that's been instrumental in helping our patients at a lower priority status receive acceptable donor heart offers. And then we also now have access with that technology to utilize donors after circulatory death, with which very few centers in the United States have access to. So that's also helping us get more patients to transplant when, they, when they're in desperate need. This is a picture of a left ventricular assist device. Um, this is what's called the HeartMate 3. Um, and this is a device that is used frequently in patients with advanced heart failure that are awaiting heart transplantation to become too ill um, to wait for that new heart or have some other immediate contraindication to transplant, such as recent substance abuse history or recent malignancy. Again, the problem in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is that many times, based on the chamber of the heart not being very dilated and the heart not being able to relax very well, these durable left ventricular, left ventricular assist devices aren't always useful and, and usually can't provide the circulatory support that's needed. So again, we really push very hard when somebody, when an HCM patient needs advanced therapies to try and get them to directly to heart transplantation and avoid some of these other mechanical devices. So in conclusion, heart failure progression in HCM is unique compared to the general heart failure population. And this often revolves around patients being younger or having less comorbidities or less other medical problems that are affecting their other organs. There are varying pathways in HCM that can lead to the development of advanced heart failure. We have to be very, again, cognizant of our younger patient population and be very vigilant and not, not miss opportunities to identify their heart failure. And then when we have identified it, earlier referral to advanced heart failure specialist is key. Again, the process for evaluation getting on the, prior, on the wait list for heart transplantation and then escalating that prioritization. That can take sometimes weeks, but sometimes it can be several months or years. So the sooner we recognize that a patient is progressing, um, the better. And then as we just discussed, the current allocation system can present some challenges, but we have found some very successful ways of providing heart transplantation to our HCM patients. And I will stop there. Back to you, Lisa.
And I am very grateful that you have found ways to get heart transplants into HCM patients because we need them. Um, about 5% of us. So um, thank you all for your great presentation tonight. And we have a bunch of questions that we're going to get to right now. Um, you guys are very efficient with your talks tonight. So thank you very much for that. You followed the rule book. Um, Dolores, I'll answer your question uh, here. What has the HCMA done to get Medicare to pay for cardiac rehab monitoring exercise? We don't qualify for monitored cardiac rehab to see if it is a trigger. So this is a very complicated question. Um, to get Medicare authorization for a, a utilization of a service, you need data and you need to apply for a code. And we do not have either the data or the code. So I have been working with a number of centers to do some programs where they do use exercise uh, rehabilitation systems to help patients identify their own limits. They're gonna to have to start as studies. They're not going to be funded um, by insurance. They're gonna to have to be funded elsewhere. And we're gonna to have to publish that data and then submit it to Medicare for consideration. It is a long process. Believe it or not, not every patient who has had a myectomy is qualified for cardiac rehabilitation because of some silly language that um, does not actually include myectomy. However, if your mitral valve is addressed at the time of surgery, the rehabilitation is covered. So there needs to be some work done here. It is a concern of ours, but it's gonna take some time to get to the conclusion. And I agree with you that it's a critical issue. Additionally, I will add that I would love to see, especially pediatric patients, be given an exercise prescription and the entire family come in to see what exercise looks like, what's safe, and help the families understand those limits in the confines of the doctor's office. So everybody's hearing the same language and they feel safe and secure to participate in the level of exercise that's appropriate for them as determined by their care team. Um, I've given this subject some thought. Dermot, any comments on what I just said? Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree more with you, Lisa. Actually, the um, American College of Cardiology last year had organized a round table uh, where they brought in experts from around the country. Uh, Lisa, you were involved with that and, and, and many others um, discussed this and they kind of had a few major take-home points. And I think one of the biggest take-home points from that was the problem with cardiac rehab, that cardiac rehab was not, not covered. And you, you, the issues you raise are exactly the issues that, that we need to address. Uh, one of the things I, I mentioned in my talk, which just briefly, as we spoke about exercise, was the Reset HCM study, which uh, is one piece of data that we have where patients were given an exercise prescription, um, and that actually showed an improvement in, in patients' ability to exercise, their quality of life, uh, and some parameters in terms of how the heart works. So I think this is something that we need to really focus on and push um uh, to get a code get data and get a code on in terms of your your point about exercise i, I couldn't agree more I, I think this is something this is something that we've made a mistake on for a long time as a profession which is frightened patients that have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy away from exercise when we really have needed to be doing the opposite we needed to be encouraging them to exercise you know patients who have hcm if you don't exercise Patients tend to put on more weight and have all these other uh, comorbid conditions that go with not exercising uh, and also have lower quality of life. So I think it's a really important part of, of what we do, trying to provide exercise prescriptions where patients feel safe uh, doing that. And, and it's been shown to improve all of those parameters. So I couldn't agree more with you. Fantastic. We'll get working on that project when we get off the line tonight. Um, another exercise question uh, from Charlotte. Regarding exercise, is there is the risk solely arrhythmic or is there a risk of causing, I, I can't, I don't have my glasses on, heart failure, I think it says. It's just something odd in that statement. Um, is there any risk of developing any other type of uh, problems from heavy lifting versus running versus intervals? So is it just sudden death we're worried about or is it progression of heart failure or aggravation of gradient? Yeah, a lot in that, I'll, I'll jump in here if that's okay. Um, 
there's a lot in that. And I think it's a really good and important question. So uh, it does, one question is, does it progress the disease? So does exercise make the disease worse? Does it cause heart failure? And the answer is definitively no. Uh, exercise actually improves um, the disease. Any data, the data we have, and it's not a lot of data admittedly, but the data we have would suggest that exercise actually improves cardiac function. Improve. Uh, Joel talked a lot about the problem with stiffening of the heart and stiffening of the heart is one of the characteristics of patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. In fact, normal hearts, as we get older, the heart stiffens. The one way to prevent that from happening is exercise. So regular exercise prevents that stiffening of the heart. So you're not putting yourself at higher risk of developing heart failure. The main risk we're worried about is arrhythmia. So dangerous arrhythmia. And, and really when that likely becomes a higher issue is when we're at very high levels, high intensity of exercise where we kind of go beyond that anaerobic threshold. And that, that kind of changes the chemistry in the heart and makes these abnormal rhythms, dangerous rhythms more likely. And so it's really where we're really doing high level intense exercise, that there is a concern that that may increase the risk of arrhythmia. And I say a concern and may, because these are things that are not proven. And I think it's it remain controversial, even within the world of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So Lisa, you know, there are experts that you will have talked to on this program that will say high intensity exercise should not be done if you've got, if you've got hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And there are others of us who feel that that is not a definitive statement. And so there the remains controversy around that, that part of it. Um, the heavy Damn lifting- and controversy? Never. <laughs> yeah. And so the, the, the heavy lifting part of it really is more related to aggravating the outflow tract obstruction. So again, when we have you in the echo room, we're getting you to bear down, we're getting you to do a Valsalva, that can make the outflow tract obstruction worse for a short period of time. And we do worry if patients are lifting really heavy weights, particularly if these are free weights and you're lifting them or you're bench pressing or something like that. If you aggravate that outflow tract obstruction, you start to get lightheaded and dizzy, that those weights can come down and hurt you. Uh, also that that could cause an increase in poor blood supply to the heart and increased risk of, of rhythms there. So uh, the weightlifting, if you have outflow tract obstruction can be a problem. And generally I will recommend specific types of weightlifting, you know, using machines, avoiding situations where the weights can kind of fall down on top of you. And we, we give some guidance around that. So hopefully that answers that. And Charlotte, I hope that answered your question. If you have a follow-up, please do post it in there. Um, I do have to say that Joseph was the first person to post a question um, and it was a comment and Dermot, he's, he's, he's a fan. He's just he's <laughs> telling you how wonderful you are. So um, I hope, you know, your head can fit out the door when you leave, but Joe is giving you a lot of praise. Um, so Joe, we've directed that one live. We didn't go into that. Okay. Um, thank you for the fabulous presentation from an anonymous attendee. How much remodeling occurs post HCM? What factor does exercise have in the term of the heart remodeling post myectomy? I'm not a hundred percent sure I fully understand your question. Um, so I'm going to ask you to clarify anonymous attendee um, as to exactly what type of remodeling you're talking about. Are you talking about as simply as a result of myectomy or are you talking about disease progression? Answer that for me if you could, and we're going to get to another question and we'll come on back to you. Um, Dolores wants to know what the CAM drug, CAM Zios, actually does to improve the functioning of the heart. Who wants to jump in on that one? We just lost... We just lost Joe and Lucy. They'll come back in. Uh, no, no, we lost John. I'm sorry. Joe, you're it, dude. We lost Dermot too. <laughs> so Joe, what does, how does Cam Zios work? I don't know what happened there. They'll hopefully pop back in. Joe, you want to take this one? Is Joe, Joe froze too. Literally every, oh, here, Joe's coming back. Give us one second, technical difficulties, please stand by. Don't quite know what happened there. 
We didn't lose any attendees, we lost faculty. Hmm, interesting. So while we're waiting for our faculty to come back on, um, Julie, why don't you disappear and maybe try to give Joe a call? Or I'm sorry, John a call? Joe halfway looks like he's here. Joe, are you back now? He's been frozen for a while. He has been frozen for a while, but he's at least in the itinerary here. Oh, uh, look. Your phone's ringing. Yes, that's Dermot texting me. I crashed. Start trying to rejoin. Um, come on back. That never it's, happened to us before. No, I wonder. No, they are on their own network. Crashed. Okay, sorry about that, attendees. Please hold on just one moment and we will address this issue. Always an exciting moment working with technology. Everything since 2020 has always just kind of been cross your fingers and hope it all works. And tonight, something glitched. I'm wondering if maybe some weather between here and there has impacted their um, uh, access. I want to answer the rest of your questions are very important. So, Joe just moved. We've got Lucy's back. Hi, Lucy. Welcome back. We're going to hope the rest of you guys can join. That's never happened to us before. Um, okay. And Dermot's back. And hopefully John will come back soon. And Stacy's back. And Julie's on the phone. And I feel like singing the Brady Bunch story right now with everybody's boxes changing. Okay. I'm sorry. I think our I think our Wi-Fi and the whole system went down. I'm sorry. Yes, we lost all of you, and Joe is just standing there smiling at us. And now we lost his, and now he'll come back. Um, so hopefully, um, everybody will come back in one by one. You're all back. Well, Joe's not back. Joe's back. Everybody's back. <laughs> Round of applause for technology. <laughs> Thank you all for bearing with us for a few minutes. You have to have a sense of humor when it comes to these things. You all just went at once, so your Wi-Fi down there or something went. Yeah. So the question on the table is, what does CAMZIOS do to improve the heart function? Who wants to take myosin inhibitors? John, you want to take it? We just have to unmute yourself because you came back. There, there you we go. go. CAMZIOS, so, what does it do? Yeah. So CAMSIOS or Mavicamptin um, reduces the number of active cross bridges between the actin and myosin filaments. These are the two contractile elements of the heart. And you can think of them as little hooks that reach out and adhere. And then during the contraction phase, the muscle shortens. Um, we know that in HCM, there are too many of these active cross bridges that form and stay uh, connected for quite a bit of time. So by lowering the number of active cross bridge elements that are active at any one point in time, we're actually reducing the vigor or force of contractility. And we're probably also enhancing the relaxation properties of the heart as well. So with Mavicamptin, this has been found to be effective in a dose dependent manner, meaning if you use too high a dose, you can adversely affect contractility too much. Uh, if you're not using enough, then the contractility is not mitigated to an adequate degree. So it takes a lot of um, fine tuning to find the right dose for the individual and make sure that they're not on other therapies that might be uh, adversely affecting the amount of, of drug that's available. Lucy, anything to add? No, that was excellently <laughs> said. The way I like to look at it quite simply for people who are trying to understand concept in a very non-scientific way, in HCM, we don't have a rowboat that we're trying to get across the shore. It's a sculling ship. So if anybody knows anything about sculling, those are those really long, narrow boats with lots of oars and lots of people pushing really, really hard. That's like the myosin heads. We're not supposed to have that many heads and they're not supposed to push that hard. We need to take our sculling ship and make it act like a rowboat so that the myosin heads don't dig in as hard and use as much as many myosin heads and it kind of relaxes some of them. 
and that helps the heart not be quite so hard. Very simplistic explanation for a very complicated mechanism. Mm -hmm. But the imagery seems to work for me to understand how myosin dips down into actin, pulls back up and creates that energy. So we're calming that energy and um, it's working quite well in many people. They're very, very happy. And we have more clinical trials to do to see which populations it works best in. And we're all still learning together. So Dolores, I hope that answered your question. If not, please put in a qualifying question. Um, clarifying question to, okay, post myectomy. So the question about what factors um, encourage um, remodeling and what happens to a post myectomy heart in terms of remodeling. Who wants to touch that one? Yeah, I can pick that. Um, so yeah, post remodeling, there's um, a couple of things that happen with the heart. One is you, you're obviously resecting that area of muscle. Uh, and so the heart looks different just because you've resected part of the muscle there. Um, as a result of relieving that obstruction, you can do a, a few different things. One is often there's less mitral regurgitation um, because during obstruction, that mitral valve gets sucked over and those leaflets can separate. So you get less regurgitation. You lower the ventricular pressure because you're relieving the obstruction. And so often you will get a reduction in volume of the left atrium. So the, that where the regurgitant volume is going into left atrium, that can get smaller. And the actual volume of muscle throughout the heart can get slightly smaller. It tends to regress just a little bit. And so oftentimes there's been a number of studies done looking at, you know, looking at strain, which is what we, what we I, I showed that image in the, uh, uh, when we were talking about echo, we were talking about deformation of the heart. You can see changes in strain that tells us that there's some changes in remodeling of the heart at a, at a very subtle level. Um, but overall, probably the biggest effect is often on the left atrium as opposed to the left ventricle there. What patients always ask is how often is, it, is this going to come back? So am I going to get more thickening and I'm going to have to go for, for a myectomy again? And the answer is no. If the, if the resection is effective on the first time, we generally don't end up seeing patients happen to come back. They don't, that muscle doesn't grow back. You don't end up needing further resections there. John, did you something you were going to add to that? Or Lisa, you were going to say something? I'll let John go first and then I'll qualify. You know, the, the other aspect is that we've seen with alcohol septal ablation, uh, there, the studies have suggested that there tends to be a higher need for re-intervention. Um, there may also be a higher risk for developing complication of complete heart block needing a pacemaker. And this can occur with myectomy, but the risk seems to be a bit lower. Um, again, your surgeon's experience is paramount in that they know how much muscle to resect without causing these other complications like heart block or ventricular septal defect, which can occasionally occur as well. I couldn't agree more with both of you on this. I will say that even in the best surgeon's hands, occasionally over time, because of the way that the heart beats, not like clapping hands, but more of a torquing, it is possible that some hearts do develop another point of obstruction over time. Probably less than one or 2%, but over time in 27 years of the HCMA, we have seen a number of people over that time have to go back for a second myectomy, even in the best hands. But it's yeah. incredibly rare, but I don't like making it a definitive never because definitives never work. So um, it was a double negative there. Did you catch me on that one? But it is, um, it is very rarely necessary, but not commonly. Um, okay, so going back to that exercise question about squatting and lifting, would you have different recommendations for somebody with apical presentation of HCM when it came to lifting, free weights, squats, deadlifts, Will a metabolic stress test be beneficial to determine how the heart is functioning during exercise? Yeah, so, so definitely more comfortable in patients with apical HCM doing weightlifting um, because you don't have that LVOT obstruction. Um, in terms of metabolic test, the metabolic test really gives us an idea of where your, an an um, your ventilatory threshold 
or your anaerobic threshold is. And so that's the kind of level where you're getting into high, and that, and that really defines moderate versus intense exercise. And so when we're talking about moderate exercise, we're talking about levels below that ventilatory or anaerobic threshold. And so the uh, metabolic stress test is really the only way that can, that can give us that information. Now we don't use the metabolic stress test to guide us in terms of weightlifting. So that's more aerobic type exercise that we're using that. Would you do me a favor? And for those who don't know anaerobic versus aerobic, could you give a definition for us? Yeah, so, so when we're exercising, the, the working muscles use oxygen and to, to create energy. That's, so that's why we're breathing. Uh, when we're exercising, there's a level below which we can just breathe and continuously uh, um, uh, get enough oxygen for those muscles to work. So essentially, this is a level where you can just run forever or you can exercise forever until you start to run out of fuel. And so there's a, a level of intensity of exercise above which you're just not able to get enough oxygen to those working muscles. And that's where we start to build up lactic acid. And so that's often the times where, you know, you're just not able to keep it above uh, exercise for above about an hour. And so when the metabolism switches where we have to start using energy that's not coming from oxygen, that would be aerobic exercise. And we have to use other fuels that's anaerobic. That's where that threshold is. And that's where we talk about going from a moderate level of exercise into a higher intense level of exercise. Okay. That makes sense. That makes sense to me. I just wanted to make sure that our entire audience understood as well. And Lisa, uh, one one other caveat that I would uh, throw out there for the patients with apical HCM who might be doing weightlifting is we'll want to keep a close eye on that apex to be sure that they're not starting to evolve a small apical aneurysm. Um, so yeah. that could have implications on our recommendations as well. So our our, our repeated imaging is really valuable in, in helping that. I'm going to lean into that question a little bit. I um, actually had a, a client call today with a left apical aneurysm. Um, we don't talk about it much, and I'm not sure that the topic has ever even come up in the Big Hearted Warrior Tour. So if you could please explain why a left apical aneurysm is important and of consequence and what could be done to manage that. Um, anybody can take that if they want. Dermot, I'll start off and then I'll pass it over to you. So um, we have seen probably in about two to 4% of our patient population that have apical HCM where the thickening is confined mostly to the tip of the heart, uh, that a small percentage of those individuals will go on to develop an aneurysm or an enlargement. Now, these are not aneurysms that we think of in the traditional sense. The heart is not going to burst, but what we see is that that wall gets progressively thinned, there's scar tissue formation, and you've got a little pouch that blood flow is reduced in. So the main risks for this, it may serve as a, a nidus for arrhythmias, um, and there have been studies suggesting that there's a higher risk of a ventricular arrhythmia, specifically in those who have apical aneurysms. And they can also form stagnation of blood and form clots. Uh, so the risk of a stroke from a blood clot breaking loose from that area. Uh, the current and most updated guidelines have recognized the apical aneurysm as an independent risk factor and those who may warrant consideration for defibrillator therapy as well as anticoagulation. So it, it's an important thing to look for. It can often be missed with just conventional echo imaging. So more and more often we're using contrast agents to highlight that area of the heart completely. Cardiac MRI is really useful in identifying these also. Um, while we don't have a surgeon here tonight, um, there is a rare procedure to um, remove these um, aneurysms. Can you discuss what that would be? Yeah, the, the Mayo Clinic has done a number of these uh, surgeries. I don't know of any other centers. I'm sure Cleveland does some as well, the Cleveland Clinic and probably Toronto General. But basically what they do is they will make an incision at that apex and cut out that portion of scarred muscle 
And then they'll, from the apex, they'll also enlarge the chamber, the cavity of the heart by resecting some of the muscle inside. And then they can use these very strong, what are called pledgeted sutures to patch the apex back together. Um, and, uh, but not a surgery or an operation that should be done in unexperienced or inexperienced hands. Um, and usually these folks uh, will also come out of the procedure needing a defibrillator because of risk of arrhythmias down the road. I've sent one patient uh, up to Mayo who's had this surgery done and he's done very well since. Uh, but again, it's, it's not a common procedure and really should be, I think, confined to really high volume surgical centers. Dermot, would you agree? Yeah, I totally agree. Yeah. I, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, and thankfully, the gentleman that I spoke to or will be speaking to tomorrow is up at Cleveland. So yeah. high volume center. Um, I don't know if he's watching tonight. If you are, I'll talk to you in the morning. Um, Joseph is asking another question. Um, will my heart rate increase? I'm thinking he's talking about on a permanent basis um, after surgery. So do you see any difference in heart rate post myectomy? Joe, do you want to take that one? Joe's been awfully quiet. We got to pull him back in. Yeah. <laughs> I've been awfully quiet. Um, the, the short answer is no. Um, and in fact, um, after surgical myectomy, there's still a risk of what's called heart block, where a conduction system of the heart, no, that's not a problem potential side effect from the surgery itself. And so there's a small percentage of patients that actually need a pacemaker uh, to keep the heart rate higher uh, after, after surgery. Fantastic. Joe, hopefully you're in on there to stay with us because the next question's for you too. Um, and I was going to ask this question as well. So I'm really glad that somebody else did. Lisa, can I can I just add one thing to what Go Joe? Right said? Ahead. I, I totally agree with what Joe said there, um, and obviously in the short term after surgery and people are anemic and things like that, the heart rate can be higher, and so that's why you said long term. The the one thing sometimes we end up doing an ablation as well at the time of uh, of myectomy for people who have paroxysmal AFib, um, and so that's one situation after uh, surgery. If they do get an ablation, you, they, the resting heart rate may actually go higher and stay higher um, after, after an ablation. So that's the one, one situation. And sometimes after a myectomy, we're able to reduce their doses of beta blockers or calcium blockers and may actually see a heart rate pick up on that basis. All great points. When is there going to be a referral from an HCM specialist to an advanced heart failure specialist? And I'm gonna put a caveat here in some HCMA recognized centers of excellence, the team includes all advanced heart failure team members, and they do both HCM and advanced heart failure evaluation. But that's the minority. The majority are, we tend to have imaging physicians in the role of HCM program directors, and then the heart failure, advanced heart failure people are either part of the team or outside of the team. So when do you think is the sweet spot to say, okay, we're moving from regular old HCM to a transplant pathway, as we call it here at the HCMA? Joe, you want to comment? Yeah, sure. That's a, that's a fantastic question. Um, so in the absence of obstruction, if somebody is hospitalized with shortness of breath or fluid retention, that's the most concerning sign. And at that point, that patient should be evaluated at least once by an advanced heart failure specialist. So just to keep it simple, that's like the biggest warning sign. Other things that we would look at are patients who are suffering from refractory ventricular arrhythmias. So Again, they have a defibrillator, they're receiving appropriate therapy from that defibrillator, and then despite medications to quell the arrhythmias, despite possibly ablation procedures to, to mitigate the arrhythmias, they're still having 
significant problems with that. That's the other time when we're really going to start thinking about heart transplantation. And other signs or symptoms would be just progressive shortness of breath, trouble with daily activities despite medications, um, lightheadedness and dizziness, again, in the absence of obstruction of blood flow, just from the heart function being weak or the blood pressure slow, um, and then difficulty with appetites, people who start losing weight unintentionally because their heart Unfortunately, Joe, we're losing your audio feed. Um, so maybe it'll come back in a moment. Um, okay, I'm, I'm going to qualify that with one other item and personal experience here. When I learned my ejection fraction had dropped into the high 40s, I was in a sense of uh, denial that that couldn't be happening to me. That's just a fluke. I probably, in retrospect, should have had my first right heart cath a bit earlier to see what my pressures were and to see where I really was, but I didn't want to do it because it seemed very aggressive. And then when I got really sick, it was almost too late to do anything about it. So it's a sweet spot window that we have to find when people start to turn. And my opinion as being somebody who went down the path and have watched many others, look earlier. If there are signs that somebody's heading that way, you can plan for it. You can do things in advance, like make sure all your vaccines are up to date, all your cancer screenings are up to date, all your dental work is up to date, so that you're not rushing to do that as you're also trying to prepare yourself physically and psychologically for getting a heart transplant. So I like to be a little bit ahead of the curve and think, well, these are the signs, here's the data. We know from the onset of drop in the direction fraction um, to death or transplant in HCM is about seven years. Drugs may elongate that a little bit since that original data was collected, but if you see these signs, I suggest going earlier than later. Doctors, nurse practitioners, what do you think? Could not agree. Yeah, more. I mean, yeah totally. Um, you know, and I, I, what I would say to reassure people is that the evaluation process does not equal transplant. So, meaning the sooner we evaluate. Sometimes we find okay, here's some things we can do to get more mileage out of what you were born with. Um, we're not rushing people ahead, but to Lisa's point, and she experienced it, of course. You know, if you wait too long, then playing that game to try and salvage somebody is much, much more challenging and much more risky. Yes, exactly. Okay, thank you so much for that. A um, couple other questions. We've got a couple other exercise ones and 3D printing question. 3D printing was mentioned. Do you see this having a more significant role? Um, more surgical insight, statistical use. What is the role of 3D printing? A lot of programs are starting to use this. I first saw it about seven years ago. It was really cool. Um, it turned out that a lot of the insides of the ventricles didn't just have a bump of hypertrophy or an area. There was actually a band that could be better visualized in the 3D imaging. So the surgical, surgical planning could be much more specific. Um, so what do you guys think? 3D printing, is it a thing? Yeah, I, I think it is. I, I think this has added another tool to our armamentarium. I mean, what, what we've learned is that we used to think that obstruction was all about the muscle and all about how thick the muscle was. And we've learned over time that that's not the case. In fact, uh, most of the problem relates to the mitral valve and the valve leaflets being too long or the position of the muscles that support the valve, the thickening and stuff like that. And that, that can sometimes, even though with, with the echoes and things like this, this is a 2D slice of a, of a 3D structure, and particularly for surgeons where they're, they're not necessarily used to looking at this all the time, actually having the 3D part in their hand and being able to visualize all of that before they actually go into the OR, uh, I think uh, it can be tremendously helpful. And I think the other part of it is actually education for patients where you can actually show them their own heart 
uh, and show them where the problem is. And, and again, sometimes for patients, it's difficult. They had never seen an echo before, and you're trying to guide them what these thin moving things are around. But if you actually have a model in your hand, I think that's tremendously helpful. John, have you anything to add to that? Yeah, no, no question. You know, as it stands right now, the 3D printing model has to be generated off of a CT scan. Um, I'm sure there's going to be developments ongoing where we might be able to use 3D imaging from ECHO or MRI to create these as well. It's a bit of a time consuming process right now, but like anything, we're in its infancy. I think it's an incredibly powerful teaching tool, uh, both for the patients and for the surgeons. I think the, the other thing that we should add is that there's no payment for these 3D models. There's no payment structure for it. So unfortunately, um, this is basically a generated by philanthropic support. Um, so you know these these models cost somewhere between a thousand to two thousand dollars to generate, uh, and that is doesn't come from anywhere. So basically, this is uh, money that's given to the hospital for to our foundation that is being supported, is supporting the generation of these models. So yeah. I, I think that that's important to emphasize. And a CT is required to create the images for which the 3D model will be rendered, correct? That is correct. Can't you, use MRI? You, you can with MRI and you can with 3D, but they're just not as good. For, for the detail that you require, so, so some, some cardiac pathologies, they will use other types of imaging to be able to generate the 3D model. But for the detail that's required for HCM, uh, I totally agree with John. I think the only way to do that is really a, a CT. So I'm gonna tell you a funny little story. After my transplant, many of you know that I retained my heart to be used as a teaching tool. And I was honored to have Dr. William Roberts down at Baylor section my heart so that we could preserve it with plastinization from the University of Toledo. Um, Dr. Baptista and Dr. Frank, great team, plastinized my heart. And I thought it would be really cool if I could make 3D copies of it. So my heart by itself went through a CT machine. <laughs> and I stood outside and watched it go through the machine. It was a unique experience for everybody present because they'd never seen the heart just kind of go by itself through the CT. I do have the, the images. Um, I will try to make another 3D image of my heart at some point, but it is not an easy process. Um, we didn't think about it until after it was sectioned. So it's in, it didn't work so well. I didn't plan it so well. So getting the 3D images that I want aren't working as well. But I can assure you, nothing brings it home as much as putting it in your hands. And very yeah. few of you will have the opportunity to put your actual heart in your hand. But a 3D image is damn close. And it is that aha moment that now I understand why I'm not feeling so well. Because this thing doesn't look so good. Okay. So do we know of any side effects from Navicamptin? Camzios. Um, I think, you know, a lot of this, we're still going to be getting some real world data right now as we're just initiating our, our first patients on it. You know, the biggest one coming from the study was obviously um, a drop in ejection fraction. So that's the main side effect and the reason for the REMS program and the frequent monitoring. From the study, other side effects that were shown was dizziness, lightheadedness, palpitations, swelling. Um, so I think we'll kind of see what, what our patients are telling us as we get it started. And all of those things that you just mentioned are also symptoms of HCM, so it's a little hard to tell sometimes. Um, I'm going to make a Cam Zios comment, and I'm going to say this because of experience with different therapies uh, of HCM through the years. Be careful of self-imposed placebo effect, people. Um, if we go back in time, we thought dual chamber pacing was going to be the thing in HCM. And in the early 90s, if you got a pacemaker, you felt better. Data that later proved mm, there wasn't really any reason for that. And there was a very strong placebo effect. Alcohol septal ablation came next. People had the procedure. They did something. So they felt better until they didn't anymore. So there is a very, very powerful part of the human body. It is called the mind. 
and it can do amazing things. Um, we literally had somebody call us and tell us after his very first dose of Kamsayos, he felt all better. It doesn't work that way. There's no way that the drug could have been absorbed into your system and provided any benefit. That is the power of the human mind. So be kind to yourself, be patient, let the drug do its thing. Don't overthink it. It's working very well for very many people. And we have very, very high hopes for myosin inhibitors, but don't think it's going to fix your problems at a couple of doses. Had somebody else call in two weeks, they thought it was not working and it's terrible and they should stop. It didn't give the drug time to work. So there's the opposite side. Be patient. We're all learning together. Go slow and we'll get good answers. Um, somebody wanted us to start a CAMS IOS discussion group at the HCMA. We won't be doing it because of the leaning into the placebo effect. So we'll discuss it in our general discussion groups, but we want to be careful that people are really experiencing what they're experiencing and that their mind isn't driving what they think is happening. Mm -hmm. So be patient, be kind to yourself, don't overthink it, and play stick with the REMS program. Any comments on that? Uh, my only comment would be that's why our clinical trials are so important and these additional ongoing investigations are imperative so that we get good quality data on which we can base sound decisions. Amen. Um, so I'm gonna reword a question here. Um, somebody used to be a cross country runner. They can't do it anymore. They put in a loop recorder. Um, now they're doing fast running. Can they do vigorous exercise? How does somebody determine what kind of activity is appropriate for that? Yeah, so uh, again, I think this comes back to what we, we talked about earlier that, you know, there's some data that we have and there's data we don't have. And the data we have shows that regular moderate exercise is safe and beneficial. But where there con where remains controversy is the high intensity exercise, vigorous high intensity exercise. And there are trials going on right now. There's studies going on where people in controlled environments are being enrolled in studies where they are doing high intensity interval training. And they're tracking to see whether that's safe and beneficial over time and whether it actually, whether it actually exposes them to higher risk. So unfortunately, a lot of these studies have very low numbers. Ultimately, the risk of sudden death with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy while you exercise is still low. I mean, we, we're concerned that it may increase with very vigorous exercise, but it's still very low. So in order to be able to answer these questions, you really need a lot of information. And this is where shared decision making comes in, right? And, and this is where the the updated guidelines in 2020, I think really were so beneficial where they, they really emphasize that there are some things that we just don't have very robust data on. We have some concerns, but there are also some data to suggest this benefit. And so this is where we just have to kind of sit down and talk about the priorities for that particular individual. Some individuals will come in and they will tell me, you know, my priority is to be safe. I want to be fit and healthy, but I want to be safe. And there we give a prescription based on those parameters where we're trying to keep them as safe as possible, but as healthy as possible. Other people will come in and say, hey, my life will literally fall apart if I can't exercise at high levels. And then we talk about what the risk of that will look like. And we try and introduce you know, safety, what we call emergency action plans for someone who says, I can't function unless I exercise at a vigorous level. And literally there are, individuals who, who really feel that way. And I, I've seen it happen where people, when they're disqualified from vi training vigorously, turn to things like alcoholism, become depressed, become obese, all of these kind of things that are probably putting them at much higher risk than if they did exercise vigorously. But then we have to talk about, you know, what, what, how can you do that, but in a safe fashion? Great point. I'm going to say goodbye to our friends on Facebook now, and I'm going to stop the recording feature. We have two final questions. Anybody who wants to ask a question can do so um, a little bit more privately in one moment. Thank you for joining us on Facebook, and good evening. <laughs>